Welcome to the day two of the Persistent Memory and Computational Storage Summit. My name is Dave Eggleston. I'm an independent consultant. We have some great speakers for you today. A few of the speakers weren't able to join us, but we've got many of the speakers that you saw on our main stage. If you've listened to their talks already, great. This should give you a little more information about what they discussed uh, during their main stage talk. If you didn't, maybe this will give you a little bit of a flavor and you can go back and watch those videos. Topics we're gonna to get into today include, of course, computational storage and persistent memory and how these all fit together. So with us today, we have Charles Fan from Memverge. We have uh, Scott Shadley uh, from NGD Systems, but also speaking on behalf of SNEA. We have Jason Molgard, also representing SNEA, now of AMD. We have Sham Iyer uh, from Dell, and he's also gonna be speaking on behalf of SNEA. And then rounding it out, we have Rob Davis from NVIDIA. So as we get into this, we're gonna start with a question and it's gonna be for Scott Shadley. Scott, during your presentation, you showed the Gartner hype cycle and it shows computational storage kind of right at the peak of that one side, right at where we have inflated expectations. So Scott, what are the expectations for computational storage and why are they inflated? Well, it's like all new and innovative technologies, right? You have to have the people that are willing to jump in and drive it and be gung-ho for it. And then you've got to push it over into where, okay, the first few guys tested the waters, proved out the technology, and then want to move it forward. And that's kind of what the hype cycle shows is you get this, everybody's interested, and as long as you can get across the chasm, everybody will use it. And you can see looking at that same hype cycle, NVMe over fabrics, for example, is another great technology that has crossed the chasm that we uh, have to deal with. And that's what we're pushing with computational storage. And one of the unique aspects of it, especially from a SNEA perspective is we brought it as a bunch of startup companies into SNEA to help ensure that it gets across the chasm. Uh, when you do one-offs, it doesn't tend to make it quite as far. And so that's one of the reasons and the, the prowess of having SNEA behind it is a whole bunch of people are working together to make it make it happen. And that's- and, and, that and what. What do you think are the key problems that computational storage are trying to solve? In, in yesterday's panel, we, we started with the point that it's inefficient data movement is the problem we're trying to solve. And Jim Handy made the case that the network is really throttling us. I posed the question to him, well, why not just fix the network? Then everything's done. And he pointed out that there's a lot of barriers to that. So we do have to move the compute closer to the data. Yeah. But how do you see the problems that computational storage is trying to solve and what are the key applications? Well, and that's a great point. Um, the data movement, we're always going to find the, the fire hose at garden hose scenario. Something's always going to be faster or bigger or wider than wherever it's trying to get to. Um, and we've seen a lot of the architecture move around compute. We have CPUs, we now have DPUs, GPUs, everything else. Computational storage, and the reason we kept the term storage was very important. Anything that you're dealing with data already stored or put into a device for storage purposes, if you can compute on that, filter, screen, manipulate, and then fish out, you shrink the size of the pipe of the extraction of that data as it feeds into the GPU or the DPU or the CPU. So what we're doing is we're optimizing the data flow by any data stored on the device can be managed more effectively at that device. It's not the end all, because you're gonna have a, a string of these, right? No one computational storage drive is going to solve the world for everybody. You're gonna put 24, 96, 100 of these in a server. So each of those can take, if it's a 32 terabyte drive, it only has to ship out one terabyte of information, not 32, to be post-processed. And that's that's really the, the premise and focus of computational storage. Got it. Let's jump over to Rob Davis. Rob is the in, representative from NVIDIA, and NVIDIA is doing very interesting things around GPUs, of course, DPUs, which is kind of a new item, and then... Uh, NVIDIA even making forays into CPUs, but of a different type. But let's focus on the GPUs and DPUs. How do you see computational storage and persistent memory fitting into the GPU and DPU architecture? Well, first of all, um, I think, uh, Dave, we think that GPUs are very important to computational storage. Many applications are impossible for standard CPUs. 
um, and in the computational storage world. And so let alone a, a SSD that has a small processor or FPGA added to it. You think of hundreds or thousands of cameras watching security fence or radars or watching some other kind of sensors by the hundreds or even thousands. Wouldn't it be great to have an AI application that can interpret that data and, um, and uh, make decisions on that data and feed back um, small pieces if, it, if required to a higher so, level? So is the thing there that that's real time, that you're, got, you're having something that can <clears throat> look and, like you said, it's very close to the data and can make a determination of real is time, but on the edge. Yeah, real time, but on the edge. I think we think computational storage and the edge are tightly coupled. Yeah, why is that? Uh, again, because in the data center, there's because in the data center, the, the storage is right there. I mean, data centers have SANs or, or network storage, at very, very high performance. And that's not really an issue. The issue is, as the was mentioned earlier, when you have tremendous amounts of storage, like cameras or radars or whatever it happens to be um, on the edge, how do you get all that data back to the compute that can figure out what to do with it? And what we're saying is use AI, use GPUs at the edge to make those determinations and feed back the um, parts of the data that need to be saved. And, you know, the rest of it, it can go into cold storage or, or sent at a much lower speed. So you started to talk about some of the applications that need that real time on the edge. Maybe give us a couple other ones. What do you, what do you think is going to be kind of really driving that adoption? And what have the barriers to adoption been so far? Well, think about um, somebody that's got a large chain of stores and they have, um, they're at headquarters and they want to get some real time data um, that's been collected over the week. And that data is in the stores. It isn't at their headquarters data center. So they could do a query to um, the stores that have uh, an AI capability and so think of a JBOF that that JBOF or that storage system has an, um, a GPU in it. And that GPU is programmed to do certain kinds to, to segregate that data into certain ways that it can be quickly responded to, you know, like a query for um, customers in uh, women's clothing or a query for, you know, dog food shelves or whatever. Now you put that, you send that information or you put that request out, that GPU knows how to get its fingers on that data immediately and send back just the data that's needed rather than all the data from all those stores for everything sold there having to be moved back to the, to the main data center um, of headquarters. Got it. So uh, let's jump to Jason here. Jason, in your presentation with Scott, you highlighted one of the key things that SNEA is working on is adding security to the API. Why, why is security so important? Why was that something that uh, was, you know, a big, big part of your presentation and what's coming in the future for the API? Yeah, great question. So I think that, um, you know, security is just um, paramount in everything uh, these days, especially storage. And uh, without a doubt, we think that computational storage is going to require security in order to uh, be well adopted. Uh, if it isn't secure and folks can't have confidence to uh, run workloads on the data or on the drive that's uh, for the data that's stored on there, then then it, that's going to be a barrier to adoption and folks are going to want to steer clear uh, just because they don't want to take that risk. And so we want to address that security and provide those uh, uh, answers right up front or suggestions maybe is a better word so that they can uh, take that into consideration and, um, and d implement a design that is appropriate and, and secure and, and is gonna protect their data. Are there other things that you see, new elements that you're bringing to the API that you think are at that same level uh, as security or kind of security is, you, you gave many, many examples of elements under that umbrella that are required there. Yeah, for sure. I, 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 security is, is definitely one of the big things we're working on. And, and that, that's the most important thing I would suggest that we have in flight at the moment. That isn't to say that there aren't other things that we can or will do down the road, but, but uh, we feel like security is, is kind of the last major topic that needs to be addressed in order to have a, a, a 1.0 version that folks can really go off and, and implement and deploy. Got it. So, um, why is that necessary to be standardized? Why is SNEA the right place to do this? Why not an individual company that 
you know, might be have a lot of influence in in the community. Uh, again, why well, why SNEA? So, yeah, great question. But I do want to clarify that SNEA is not inventing any security standards. We are without mm. a doubt in expecting folks to use the the security standards that are already out there. Um, we don't want to invent anything new. We don't want to uh, suppose that we are better or, or know more than anyone else. Uh, that certainly isn't the case. So we're recommending that everyone leverage the existing security standards. But what we're trying to do is just pull together those pieces and say, you should go look at this back or that or, or the other um, because they're, they're kind of spread throughout. And um, by, by providing those references or suggestions on here, these are the things you need to look at, then hopefully uh, folks can, can go reference the source and, and uh, build that into their devices. So let's jump to Sham because you're working on something in a way that's similar. Again, under SNEA, it's the SDXI initiative. Maybe, and I think you're, you're focusing on a, important area, which is going to be that memory data movement. And I, I think as we were chatting earlier, you talked about how this covers both computational storage and persistent memory and having that standardized for standards for data movement is so critical. Why, why is that a case, Sean? I mean, why, why is this a big piece? Yeah, great. Thanks, Dave. I think what we are fundamentally trying to do is, you know, uh, we've had a memory data movement standard uh, until now, and that's software-based uh, mem copies. Well, you we know. like mem copy. Why? Why get rid of it? Why do something different? Well, one, the problem is there are too many of them, and they take away from application, uh, you know, compute cycles. So you can't do something interesting uh, when you're busy trying to do just some of your buffer copies. And when we try to solve this problem. Uh, we say we have, we've tried this with different kinds of accelerators. You know, programming interfaces have been there. Uh, DMA is not something new. You know, it's been there since you know compute architecture has been there. The challenge has been to standardize it in such a way that you can now uh, fire a memory data movement, forget about the data movement, get to know when the data copy happened. And then all this while, the application can be doing something more interesting. The, the, the second part about this is we are living in a world where, as you say, we've got persistent memory, which is now part of the data in use memory, which means our memory is getting expanded to include characteristics of persistent memory. Uh, with CXL, we are further expanding the data in use memory, which means we're going to have classes of memory and tiers of memory. We need efficient data movement and in a standard way, such that a plethora of applications can make use of it. So what I hear you saying is one of the themes is memory tiering is upon us. And that's only going to make things more complicated. You know, before maybe we we're moving things from NVMe SSD, we're moving in and out of DDR DRAM. But now we're going to have these tiers of memory, some of which may be persistent, some of which not. We're going to talk in a minute about CXL attached memory too with Charles. But it seems like, yeah, the picture is getting really complicated. Why is SDXI, again, kind of an essential element to help us navigate this more complicated world with more tiers? Yeah, great question. Because I think first we are trying to get the basics right, which is to solve this for uh, just regular DRAM memory as well, because we've got a bunch of uh, applications and use cases that can benefit right with, uh, you know, uh, offloading these memory copies for the DRAM use cases. What we are also seeing is that whenever you want to basically use the different classes of memory as tiers, you're sort of initiating data movement into those tiers. And if you had to use your existing compute infrastructure to be able to move those data movement uh, into those other tiers, then you are basically uh, taking those that problem and expanding it to these other classes of memory, which may have like slower characteristics. They may have more latency than DRAM. And so you need something more asynchronous, something more uh, standard instead of having to deal with different classes of accelerators. And then how, how does this sharing, because one of the things which uh, Alan Benjamin, who wasn't able to join us today, he was talking about CXL, especially with CXL 2.0. Now you put switches in, now you're sharing across an entire network between different compute nodes. Again, that, that doesn't that also complicate the picture? So now we've got tiers, we've got sharing, 
we could have pooling. How do we, how do we manage all that? Will SDXI be able to uh, get its arms around that whole picture or is it just one piece and we need other elements? So certainly what SDXI is trying to cover today is within the system, uh, how do you, uh, you know, solve this problem of memory data movement and, and tiering and acceleration? So with CXL, like you said, different pools of memory are now going to be made part of the system. They could be across a switch, across, uh, you know, shared with another host. So uh, as long as they're still part of the system physical address space, SDXI is still going to be useful. At the same time, we have also talked about something called a connection manager. Uh, one of the important things about STXI is it helps you move data between two or more different address spaces. And the way that you allow these address spaces to communicate with each other, STXI is envisioning a future where a connection manager would be able to broker that connection. Got it. So let's bring in Charles Fan because Charles at Memverge, you know, talked about in the beginning of his keynote address is we've got some problems in the cloud infrastructure. And uh, Charles, give us a little more color about what those problems are that, that you're trying to solve. I believe you had four or five problems there that you feel are, are really uh, an issue when somebody tries to use cloud or cloud slash on-prem. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the cloud has been great and, and it's been great, especially if you have a stateless application, um, it's agile, it's, uh, you know, on demand and, um, uh, and you swipe your credit card and uh, you can run it there. But it has not been true for uh, data intensive, high performance applications. Um, you know, there are a number of issues that's preventing many of these workloads from moving to cloud. The first being cost. Cloud is actually quite expensive if you're running a lot of uh, workload or using a lot of nodes and running there all the time. It's actually not easy to move workload from on-prem to the cloud. It's not easy to cloud burst and it is not easy to move from one cloud to the other. So there are a number of issues that uh, to, uh, to run. Yeah, talk about, talk about that last one a little more. That was the one that surprised me a little bit in right. hearing that you, you, it seems like once you work with a cloud provider, you're kind of captive to them is what you're right. describing. It's very, very difficult to, to move. What, what are some of the issues there in, in moving from one cloud provider to another? So, so there are uh, a number of issues, uh, you know, moving from one cloud to the other, or even from one region to another, or one instance to another within the same cloud. Uh, there, are, there are political ones, there are business ones. Uh, some of those we cannot solve with technology, uh, but with the technology, there are some problems too, especially if you have a long running workload that's there running for weeks or months. And how do you move a running application from one place to the other. And that is one problem that we are able to solve with our application capsule. Where oh, we can, I see. We can capture a running application at a point in time and move that to another instance in the same cloud or in another cloud or from on-prem to, to the cloud. And that's I one see. of the key technologies that we have developed. So let's back up for a minute because again, you described a number of issues with uh, dealing with your data in the cloud in, in the cloud infrastructure, but why is CXL a particularly attractive solution mm -hmm. to several of these problems? Yeah. So you know, first, you know, just to a one sentence introduction, what we do is we do uh, sort of a memory virtualization software or software-defined memory, uh, and so it's an interesting infrastructure capabilities running on top of memory that enable interesting services for the applications. And CXL is interesting in at least two ways. Uh, the first is uh, pretty vanilla. CXL 1.1 can give us that. Uh, it basically extends the capacity and bandwidth of your memory subsystem. Uh, and, and that in turn makes our software more useful once you have a bigger uh, and uh, faster uh, memory under, underneath. Uh, but it's a second one I think that's more interesting and particular applicable to the cloud is that when you are building a cloud infrastructure, it is desirable for a cloud service provider to have all the resources to be independent of each other. You know, for example, you want your storage 
to be independently scalable and manageable. You want your GPUs to be independently scalable and manageable, and you want your network to be independently scalable and manageable so that you can compose them as needed. Uh, one thing that they couldn't do yet is the memory. So memory is always tightly coupled with compute uh, in today's architecture. And I believe with CXL 2.0 and 3.0, it's the first real memory disaggregation we're gonna see that allow memory to become independent, become a first class citizen of a data center and become independently scalable. And I think that's gonna be a very good news for cloud service providers. And that can enable interesting services like ours. Uh, that so, running on top so of I've it. heard a speaker in the past describe at supercompute describe, hey, you know, in supercomputers, everything's disaggregated, including memory. Uh, I'll take his word for it. I don't really know. <laughs> but he said that's now we're really applying this to the, the server. So what you're describing, I've talked about in the past of, you know, we're, we're in uh, server jail or DDR jail for memory, right? You're, right. you're stuck inside the box. Right. And we've heard other speakers in other conferences allude to, you know, a very high percentage of DRAM in a server. Uh, it's just kind of sitting there almost as right. kind of an over provisioning inside the box in case you need it. Now you could break it out and share it. And uh, come back around another question for you, Charles. Does it matter for in, in these cases, is it persistent memory or can it be volatile memory or, or both you, that you want? I think it is both. Persistent memory certainly add a, an additional layer of uh, persistence and that can enable interesting availability uh, services on top of it. But even if just volatile memory on CXL already is a game changer, I believe. Uh, so in some ways I see there's an evolution you know, from persistent memory to really a, a disaggregated capacity tier memory uh, that could have persistence to some of it, but may not need to be. And I think this itself is a game changer to the uh, computer architecture. Got it. So let's bring it back to Sean. Tell us a bit more about how persistent memory and computational storage work together under this umbrella of XDSI, or are they really separate entities? Are they mutually supportive or we should think of them differently? Yeah, so I, I think we're kind of like a glue for them as well, in the sense that, you know, we are trying to uh, democratize memory data movement, irrespective of what class of memory or tier of memory it is, because at the end, they're just memory pointers for the data structures that we're trying to standardize. Irrespective of the accelerator, it's going to be one way of moving data and stopping, and you know, those kind of stuff. So persistent memory being added to the system physical address space means it's just another memory pointer. So as it's just like you would do software-based memory copies, you would do memory data movement to persistent memory targets. Now, because it's persistent, it almost kind of feels like storage because then you need to have storage like data services associated with it. And that's where computational storage is very interesting because you know, imagine a world where you are solving a computational storage use case and STXI based devices are the ones that are performing the memory to memory data movement. That's a, a picture where persistent memory exists, SDXI exists, and a computational storage workload gets done. Interesting. Well, yesterday's session, Andy Rudolph in his talk pointed to a case where persistent memory can be used, where it's transparent to the user. He talked about, you know, he talked about in terms of low latency storage, but then he gave the example of, well, what about the metadata? What if you wanted metadata to be stored very quickly and do a load and store access instead of doing an IO? And that might be a place where the metadata can be uh, stored and possibly even shared very quickly. Do you see that as a possible use case for persistent memory going forward? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what is the threshold for the load and store. If if the load and the store do need acceleration, then you know you you might want to offload that with uh, an SDXI based accelerator. If it's something that can be done uh, pretty quickly with say a compute, uh, uh, you know, because it fits into the cache line, you know, it, it the load store may be done, just done by the by the compute in that case. Got it. So Rob, let's come back to you. Charles made his case for, for CXL and in particular around memory and memory management. What, what do you see as the adoption of CXL on GPUs and DPUs? Is that coming soon or is that still over the horizon? 
So from an NVIDIA networking platform group perspective, so I came from the Melnox acquisition, so I'm not, I can't really speak to Grace, which is our CPU or our GPUs, but from the networking products division, um, we're watching it, um, but um, you know, that's, we are, we are not committed to providing products for that at this time, just because we don't see our customers asking for it. What yes, we yes. do have is NVLink, um, and I'm talking from the GPU side now, um, which connects GPUs together. And we just announced at our last uh, GTC that we're doing that in Iraq now, and that's connecting the memories of those GPUs together. So we're, we've already been doing that because of the need to work on bigger and bigger problems with GPUs for quite a few years now internally and now in the rack. And then we also have, you talked about HPC earlier, we also have InfiniBand technology on the networking side that's been connecting those memories that the, that the people at Supercomputer told you about for 10-ish 10, 10 years, maybe more now. So I think um, that's one of the reasons why we're just watching it because we've been using technologies like that for quite a long time. And if it's going to become important and our customers ask for it, of course that changes things. But right now we're delivering those capabilities with, with what we have today. Yeah, it seems like CXL, especially CXL 2.0, is addressing some of those deep memory needs. Uh, we had yesterday Chris Peterson from Meta talking about AI, AI workloads, and how CXL really helps him uh, get these new tiers just below DDR on the memory pyramid and how that lets him address it. But it sounds like for GPUs, that's not really a driving need yet. And my understanding was even the CXL 3.0, does that enable enough accelerators to to scale out. So I know that that was, has been an issue for greater GPU adoption. But Rob, how do you see persistent memory and computational storage working together in the future? Uh, your focus has been on computational storage, but how, how do these two possibly fit together? Well, as Charles knows, because he uses a lot of our equipment, um, mm -hmm. RDMA, you know, uh, uh, over networks has been happening for quite a long time, like I described some of the systems a minute ago. And uh, so we see it as another um, device that can be connected over remote direct memory access across networks with Rocky technology or InfiniBand technology, Rocky on Ethernet or InfiniBand technology. You mentioned DPUs earlier. Yes. So. Um, DPUs are, are, are um, data processing units. Um, they're designed. Yeah, describe, describe that a little more because possibly for some of the people, that's a new term for mm -hmm. them. Maybe they haven't looked into what DPUs are trying to address in the data center. Right. So basically they're designed, um, if you think of a GPU, it's designed to offload and accelerate compute for a CPU. A DPU is designed to offload and accelerate um, data movement for a CPU. And more than that, to secure that data movement from um, security threats. So I know that um, Jason mentioned security earlier, and we see DPUs coupled with GPUs as a very important um, of technologies uh, for um, computational storage. Um, Is that because you're, you're keeping it isolated there? That you you know there's no conflict well, between in a multi-tenant system, or how how do you see that? Well, if you go back to what I said earlier, usually um, computational storage we think is an edge problem um, because data centers have everything there and highly, highly uh, high performance networks to connect it all together. But on the edge, of course, you've got that hose versus fire hose problem. You're on the, you're on the garden hose, right? Um, back to the data center. So what we see the DPUs, which are one of the components of a DPU is actually a, a fairly powerful ARM processor. So if we couple that with a GPU, now we've got the ARM processor being offloaded from its compute functions and accelerated by the GPU. We've got the, the, the networking being accelerated by the DPU. So it's a perfect fit for the edge where you've got power, space, all kinds of requirements. So for example, the, I think I talked about earlier, you drop one of those into a JBOF, which is just a bunch mm -hmm. of flash that we, you know, DPUs are already being used as single chip controllers for. Now you've got computational storage just by replacing one circuit card in a, in a JBOF. Got it. Scott, let's come back to you. You talked in, in your presentation with Jason about some futures uh, plans in the SNEA CS Twig. 
to support XPU. What what does that mean? How does that tie in with this emergence of DPUs? Or does it? Yeah. And so SNEA is, is adopting for the time being the term XPU because we've got multiple different names for it in the, in the industry uh, from different vendors. But um, we in the computational storage group have what we call computational storage drive, which is a storage-based product with compute. We also created a specific product called a computational storage processor and that processor is the likes of a DPU where it does compute in the storage space, but it doesn't actually have storage. And it, it's kind of a hierarchy of compute that we're creating, right? So you have your GPU, then you have your DPU, you can have a CSP and then you have a CSD. And the reason you have all these is because you need access to your data in different places and you have different protocols involved. So the DPUs and the IPUs and the XPUs are sitting network to storage and the CSP and the CSD are sitting at storage. So they're only using the storage protocols and technology. So these are all very complementary solutions. They're not all needed for every segment of every market, of course, but we're creating a, a better, I guess you could call it um, alphabet soup for our customers to find the right things for the right use cases. And it can be power-based, it can be space-based, it can be you know whatever those constraints are. But the goal is to make sure we don't create any one architecture that doesn't complement the other. Because if, so, we, if we do, we just break the system down even So more. does the CSD itself, does it need to know what it's attached to or you're saying it's agnostic? It can be agnostic, it can be transparent. Several presentations were given today where the computational storage was a transparent feature. Uh, it can be completely host managed. It depends on how the implementation is. That's one thing we're not doing within the twig is gating what vendors can or can't do with it. We're just highlighting the, the architectures for that. And one of the perfect examples is one of the presentations being given at the summit, how computational storage from SNEA is parlaying in with NVMe because we are not protocol specific. We're industry agnostic, we're network agnostic associated to the, the devices. And so that's a, a good example. If you haven't had a chance to see that session, take a look and see how we overlap the two technologies because that's part of the alliance work that uh, SNEA does with other organizations as well. So Very let's shift. We're doing with CXL. Let's shift to one of the problems. It was it was pretty dominant in yesterday's panel in talking about software as a key enabler for these types of technologies. So so Scott, why why is this software so important to get adoption uh, of computational storage, and what problems have you seen in the industry so far, and how do those get addressed going forward? So from that perspective, um, software is written to take advantage of certain building blocks that are associated to it. CPU, memory, storage. That's the original, right? We add in a GPU, your software has to evolve to know there's another branch available. We're adding more branches to this compute tree. The software has to evolve around that. Uh, I, my company, for example, had a perfect example. A company came in and said, we want to run Elasticsearch and computational storage. We think it's going to be great. Well, Elasticsearch as a software application was written as a memory centric footprint. You offload it to compute, it's not pulling storage or stored data at all times. So the computational storage solution would be to actually have to do something different with Elastic, right? It doesn't say it's bad, it's just not a perfect fit. Where other applications like AI inference, you've got a whole bunch of video streams as mentioned before, all that data is coming into the storage devices, why not pre-screen them? In the and storage That's and unfortunately, example. Andy Walls wasn't able to join us today, but he, he started off his talk with a, a very a mental model, which was very helpful to me. He said, think of storage software itself as an application. And then yep. we're just using computational storage to offload some part of that application right near storage. I really like that, that mental model. Let's jump to Jason. Jason, tell us a little bit more about how the work in the, the CS... Uh, Twig is is addressing this issue of offloading some part of storage software as an application to the hardware itself. Well, so uh, you know, one of the things that uh, you know we talked about uh, software API earlier, and and not only is that uh, API being defined in terms of uh, what what are kind of the, the standard functions and what would that look like from a standards perspective, but I know that there's some software development actually to that standard that's in progress with the intent of making that open source. Uh, and, and I'm sure that other member companies would be welcome to join that effort. But now if there's a kind of a standard library of, of software that's available um, and, and everyone's contributing to it, then it becomes uh, very easy to control uh, the offload. And, and, um, and I think that one of the very interesting cases that has been touched on already is, is we've got all these different um, methods of offload and they, they're not 
um, mutually exclusive. You can have multiple layers of offload, multiple levels of offload, depending on the application. You, you know, you could offload from the host CPU to to the DPU to the or the XPU uh, to the CSD um, and and run various workloads at various levels and and move them seamlessly back and forth across um, the devices, especially if everything is a, a kind of a, a, a standardized view of the software that needs to be uh, run on them. So one of the things Andy also talked about is we're, we're going to see even more of uh, offloading from the host down to these devices. You know, he gave some some simple cases, but doesn't that mean we're reaching into the host application even more and having to make it aware of the CS device down there? And doesn't that kind of give us a difficulty in, in getting the adoption? We don't get that transparency that we talked about earlier if we have to modify the host application. Or do you see that as being more application specific of when we'd want to do that? Yeah, I think it's going to be more application specific. Um, I, I think that that it, it, it may be possible. Uh, I, I think that for, for many applications that it, it could just be the device driver itself that changes uh, uh, underneath the, the application. So the application becomes less aware of that and it's abstracted away and, and then it goes off and, and um, uh, executes on one of those levels of offload. Um, but, but certainly some applications may indeed need to be modified in, in order to support all that. Uh, you know, certainly um, I, I don't have any specifics that I Got would it. be able to highlight, but I think that you know, some investigation would point us to one way or another as, as time progresses. Okay, so Sham, your view on, on this and software, we're talking about being a key element, but how, I, I posed this question a little bit earlier, but how is SDXI and the work being done there, how is that different or the same as what Memverge is doing, what VMware is doing with Capitola, what Samsung is doing with their SMDK? Are these efforts trying to solve the same problem and competitive, or do they layer on top of each other? How, how should I think about you know, all these different efforts? Well, first of all, let me also point out that you know VMware was one of the founding members of the STX Technical Working Group, along with Dell and a few uh, others, along with AMD, actually. So they've been part of this generally from the beginning. Memverge also has been a very uh, uh, you know important contributing member for the STXI Working Group. So I, uh, in in a way, I think we are bringing about we have got 28 member companies and about 80 plus members. So we are finding a lot of use cases that are important and to layer applications on top of it. So it's, it's, a, it's a matter of kind of prioritizing the right kind of applications, but certainly things like you mentioned, Capitola or some of the use cases that Memverge is trying to solve, we think STXI can be a great enabler. Uh, we, we think it can boost their efforts in trying to solve so the does it yeah and let me interrupt does this and i'm not clear on this does this re reside below them in the software stack above yeah. them as an umbrella where, where does it reside it, it resides below them in the software stack i uh, see if you if you think about it we are eliminating the layers of software stack by allowing user space applications to also be able to take advantage of this so you know any any application that wants to make use of it, it can do so Okay, so Charles, uh, final word on this. Building Memverge software on top of S SDXI, is this something you foresee? As he indicates, you've been closely involved. And again, how do you compare and contrast your efforts with, again, VM Capitola or something else? Yes, so um, SDXI is a very complementary effort to our effort. And uh, we have been an active participant uh, in that initiative as a uh, uh, Sham uh, 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 described, I think, Bo, one, one of our top engineers is pretty active on that, uh, in that group. And uh, we see this as a potential uh, streamlining of the today's memory mover uh, capabilities. Uh, it will be the next gen uh, for that. And we welcome that uh, very much. And we see our software can take advantage of it in the future. And and I think the other Capitola and others could also do the same. You know, us with Capitola, I think it's a little bit more competitive, mm. uh, uh, but SDXI uh, works with both of us.
Yeah, we talked a little bit earlier, Charles, I, I guess one more point here on the memory tiering that's coming. You know, how does that present both opportunity and challenges for members and what you're trying to achieve? And, and how keen are your customers to address this issue of memory tiering? Right. So are you referring to the Linux kernel effort uh, that is uh, adding the memory tiering capability? Or You, you, you tell me, because okay. I, I think it's something we see in CXL yeah. is this opportunity to do, you know, have this uh, wide, I'll just call it wide fan out through the switches, right. but then also multiple devices that are shared right. and using them in different ways. So again, Chris Peterson uh, from Meta yesterday talked about having this tier right below DDR in the memory yeah. pyramid. And he talked about a capacity tier and a bandwidth tier in there right. where he can handle a little bit slower latency. But man, now that's a lot of things. You know, he's handling HPM, he's handling DDR, he's got to handle this CXL attached memory. That's yeah. a lot of stuff to keep track of. It is. Uh, I think it's a huge area. Uh, and it's related to a lot of things we do here. Um, you know, I think overall memory is becoming more heterogeneous, just like compute is as well. And once you have different kinds of memory, there is uh, naturally a tiering of memory that took place. And people desire to have some automation in those tiering, promotion and demotion of memory pages from one tier to the other. And, and hopefully make this transparent to the application. So the application does not necessarily have to be aware where the data goes, which type of memory it goes to. And so, so there are a number of uh, companies and uh, efforts uh, that are approaching this problem from different angles. And in some ways, data movement between memory is a necessary component to enable the memory tiering. Yeah, it's there kind of a, be a key element. Right, key element. And there needs to be key element on the profiling of the memory access to allow you to make decisions. And then there are different environments. You know, Capitola is doing so for vSphere environment from within the vSphere. Uh, there, are, there are solutions like ours who are doing it from a user space, uh, which is trying to be least intrusive uh, to the kernels or the hypervisors. And then there are some kernel projects who are working I, on that front. I have a feeling next year we could do an entire panel on memory tiering and the challenges. I think the yeah, industry is right. just getting its arms around. Okay, let's shift to our very last segment here. We're calling this sound bite. And I want to get your walkaway point for any of our attendees. What do you want them to remember in five words or less? Mr. Scott Shadley, let's start with you. Computational sto er, storage will be mainstream. There's your five words. <laughs> Outstanding. Rob Davis. DPUs, DPUs with GPUs answer computational storage. Outstanding. I like it a lot. Uh, Jason, soundbite from you. Computational storage will be secure. Nice. Way to pull in the security, Sean. <laughs> Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, make accelerated memory data movement boring. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Phenomenal. Charles, your sound bite. All right. Composable memory to the cloud. Excellent. Yeah. Well done, guys. Let me just quickly share the screen for the wrap up. Thank you for all of our uh, speakers today. And as talked about, if you haven't had a chance yet, to view their videos, please do so. Um, and rate us on this session. I think our speakers here, I'm gonna give them my round of applause. They did a fantastic job. I don't know what the rating scale is, but clearly they deserve the maximum. So please rate us and give us your comments on this session. Thank you for joining us. Uh, appreciate all the involvement from the speakers here today and look forward to seeing you hopefully in the future, face-to-face -face at a, a future summit.